We are students from KPIS, and recently we've partnered with UNESCO in designing a sculpture. The sculpture was not only advocating for the recycling of plastic, but it was also advocating for peace. And to us, peace means being able to celebrate our differences. Peace means being able to live in the environment feeling loved. And this is why we believe that we need to sustain our environment because it is where we live. Even though we are currently becoming more globalized as citizens of the world, one of the biggest challenges regarding peace in our country right now is the fact that many of us are still closed off to change and others' differences. This is why we try our best to inform our community about the issues surrounding us constantly. We want people to be more compassionate, more thoughtful, and more mindful and less close-minded. My name is Orani Jaria Portnyam from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Hi, Nay. Nay. Hola, no, 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 Strengthening language skills will eliminate prejudice in our between cultures. I support the right to a quality education. from Bangkok, Thailand. With the creation of the Benchong Spanning the Generations program, I aim to educate and develop young people's knowledge and curiosity about the traditional art form Benchong, a special type of enamel porcelain. You wanna this? By advocating intergenerational exchange and supporting youth to positively influence their communities. For me, peace entails societal harmony, stability, conflict, and violence. Fun no, he said. is ensuring young people will have a sustainable future. The reason I do this work is because I believe young people have the right to have a secure future. <laughs> I think the biggest challenge for my country today is climate change impacts and people being displaced by these impacts, like typhoons and floods. I would like people to change the way that they treat the environment, because without it, we will not be here. ศิลปะตะวันแสงดาราเมื่อจากนครหนุนหมิงจันทร์ประเทศลาวข้าพเจ้าเป็นผู้ยิ่งข้ามเพศกับกลุ่มภูมิใจที่เป็นเฮาข
Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the first of our Together for Peace T4P webinars. Um, this is the first of three webinars, and thank you to everyone who has joined us today. And I hope you can also join us on the 16th of February and the 9th of March for the second webinars. So today uh, we have a very interesting program with a, a keynote speaker, a panel, and then an opportunity for all of you to be part of the discussion. So um, I will um, be just introducing the first speakers who will tell you more about the content. And I just want to give you a little bit of logistics first. So uh, you can make comments or ask questions in the chat function in Zoom. And for those of you who are in Facebook Live, you can leave comments in the Facebook Live. They will be forwarded to our moderators and fed into the Q&A, which will occur after the panel. Um, and in the breakout rooms, you'll also be able to provide either through speech or the chat function into your discussion into the different groups. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available through our uh, media channels after the webinar. And so that can then be shared, shared with anybody that was unable to join or if you would like to check anything out. Uh, so after the introductions, we will have a keynote um, speech from Dr. Nandini Chatterjee. And then we will have a panel with three speakers before the four breakout rooms. I will give you more instructions about the breakout rooms just before we get there. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, our two speakers who will provide opening remarks. The first is Mr. Shigeru Oyagi, who is the director of UNESCO Bangkok, the Regional Bureau of Education. And he will be followed by uh, opening remarks from Mrs. Yukiko Matsuda, who is the director of multilateral cultural cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan. And Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of course, is our key partner and supporter of this initiative. Uh, to Mr. Aoyagi to give the first opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Sue, for your introduction. Uh, can you see me? Yes. Okay. Well, the, let's then begin. The, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Mrs. Matsuda, Director, Multilateral Co Cultural Cooperation, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Japan, and also to Professor Yoshida, Co Chair of the Education 2030 Global Student Committee and my colleague and friend Ananta, director of UNESCO Category 1 Institute. Let me just... We cannot hear, it's muted. It's muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, then I'll begin from the very beginning. Well, this is Matsuda, Director, Multilateral Cultural Cooperation, uh, yeah. Minister of Foreign Affairs Japan, Professor Yoshida, co chair of Education 2030 Global Steering Committee, my colleague and friend, Ananta, Director of UNESCO Category 1 Institute, MGIP, dear Secretary Generals, Deputy Secretary Generals, and high officials of national UNESCO commissions across the Asia and the Pacific, colleagues of UNESCO and uh, UN, and dear participants. A very good morning and afternoon to you all, and I'd like to welcome you all to the first Together for Peace. We cannot hear you. Sorry, I think the organizer have to mute everybody and then the, I was one of them. So everybody listening to me, please mute yourself and then listen to me. Uh, I said the thank you all and then I'd like to welcome you all on this first webinar. The, today's webinar, the, we will the, introduce you 
to the importance of social and emotional learning. I can hear some voice from somewhere. Can everybody mute your phone? Okay, I think now it's all right. Yes, the, we will discuss how we can release the potential of positive peace through education in today's seminar. The positive peace that was originally proclaimed by Norwegian sociologist Johan Galton is a base for a world of no war, no conflict, and no violence. It constitutes holistic, inclusive, and equitable environment that allows individuals and societies to develop respectful relationships with others and with the planet. Positive peace is about the presence of justice, equity, and equality for all for building more peaceful and sustainable world. Building positive peace is something we can all agree as foundation for the future of our communities and planet that next generations should also appreciate. However, making this reality is of course never easy, especially in the world we are living today. Climate crisis, refugees and migrants, poverty, human rights violations, gaps in wealth and education, digital divide, environmental degradation, and wars and conflicts. These global challenges are the cause and effect of absence or incomplete existence of positive peace. We know that maintaining the status quo and not change the way we are doing today will lead us to the more unpeaceful and unsustainable future. So what do we do now? Education plays a significant role in nurturing and developing respectful relations. Beyond the crucial function of transferring knowledge and skills, education plays a key role in shaping attitude, values, and the behaviors of individuals. When we remember UNESCO's four pillars of learning, which are learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together, and learning to be, the last two are often overlooked in content current uh, education systems as schools tend to fill learners with mainly knowledge and skills for them to prepare for the world of work. In the current context, education systems often continue to emphasize academic achievement rather than pro-social behavior, empathy, understanding, and holistic self-development. And in many contexts, formal education settings struggle to accommodate diversity and transformation of the world. Changing the way we deliver education may seem difficult, but it is achievable. There are many little things that we can do even within the existing system. We can see concrete examples of quite a few countries that embrace the vital role of transformative education. Conventional peace and human rights education, for example, could contribute to building lasting peace. But at the same time, education needs to be beyond and transformed to achieve human flourishing, to facilitate the well-being of the self and of the other. In this webinar, we will listen to Dr. Chatterley's keynote on social and emotional learning, in which she will speak about the importance of transformative education, embedding social and emotional competencies in the education systems, not only for the attainment of peace and sustainability, but also for improving academic performance and life skills, and reviving education's humanist and social functions with a holistic approach to ensure learners positive engagement with the world. SDG 4 on quality education for all, especially its target seven, encourages us to strengthen national and local education capacities to equip learners with knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes required to address the global challenges by promoting a culture of peace, 
and nonviolence and engaging them with the world as responsible global citizens. For us, building relationships and connections and getting to know each other are one of key steps in the Together for Peace initiative. Today's webinar is the first in a series of three that are designed to generate dialogue on how we can build positive peace in education, sciences, culture, again it's mute again i cannot hear you everybody please kindly mute your phone so that the organizer cannot doesn't have to do mute your phones <laughs> I enjoy the voices of children, but uh, not now, I hope. All right, let's begin. I'm closing, I'm coming to the, the last the part of my speech, but what I said is that for us, the building relations and connections and uh, getting to know each other, are one of the key steps in the Together for Peace initiative. And today's webinar is the first in a series of uh, three that are designed to generate dialogue on how we can build positive peace through education, sciences, culture, and communication. Each of the webinars, we look at a different aspect of how to build positive peace with intent to identify some strategies and recommendations for member states to further discuss during the regional dialogue on Together for Peace in March this year. Uh, with us today, a uh, representative from government, teachers, academics, NGOs, and others from countries across Asia and the Pacific. The richness of their discussions will arise from the diversity. Diversity in nations, cultures, religions, races, and life and professional experiences. They are but just the differences that can unite us much stronger when we see them as just they are neither more or less, but with respect. Uh, dear participants, this webinar and the Together for Peace initiative have been made possible by the kind of generosity and support of the government of Japan, Minister of Foreign Affairs. I thank you, Mrs. Matsuda. I'd like to also thank our partner, MJP, the UNESCO Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development, which provides leadership and expertise in the area of social and emotional learning for peace and sustainable development in the region. And of course, our appreciation should go to our guest speakers, panelists, who will provide a range of perspectives for different ways to apply transformative pedagogies. Mr. Majid from the Ministry of Education in Motives, Mrs. Piramal from C Learning in India, and Mrs. Matsukula from Age Ooishi Junior High School in Japan, and of course to Professor Yoshida, who is the uh, lecturer in, in Hiroshima University, Japan. Uh, everybody, dear participants, please enjoy the webinar, really participate, and we look forward to working with you as we develop and roll out together for peace. And thank you for your attention. And once again, welcome you all to this very important deliberations for making our dates. Thanks so much. Yuragi, um, and just before I hand over to Mrs. Matsuda, just another reminder to everybody to please mute your microphone um, so that we don't keep having interruptions like we just did. So um, Mrs. Matsuda, I'd like to invite you now to provide your opening remarks. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everybody from Tokyo. I'm Yukiko Matsuda. Thank you for introduction. And at the outset, I would like to express our sincere appreciation to UNESCO Bangkok office, headed by Director Aoyagi and Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development, the Ministry of Education in Thailand, and all partners involved in this webinar. I'm delighted to participate participate in this T4P webinar today because this is an important step 
in the T4P regional dialogue, which will take place in March this year. A, sustainable, uh, a substantive discussion on transformative pedagogies is one of the three areas of action recommended by the T4P experts to strengthen peace education. This topic is also very pertinent given the changes our planet has experienced, experienced over the past one year. Transformative pedagogies are fundamental to learning to live together in a peaceful way in a world that has been fundamentally altered by the spread of COVID-19. I hope this event will open up space for public dialogue on the important topic of building positive peace through education. Member states, educators, academics, youth, and others can share ideas that will contribute to the T4P roadmap. I understand that uh, uh, we will also have an opportunity to hear about social and emotional learning today from leading experts. I hope all participants, whether you are a community worker, teacher, or a policy maker, will exchange views on practical ways to apply social and emotional learning in your work. And in particular, how we can apply social and emotional learning to building positive peace. In conclusion, it is our great pleasure for MOFA Japan to support the important regional initiative of this T4P together with UNESCO National Commission of UNESCO member states in the region and all participants joining today. We expect to see tangible result of the T4P regional dialogue in which MOFA Japan will be interested and involved in strengthening regional cooperation in carrying out T4P initiative. Thank you very much for your attention and best wishes for the fruitful discussions today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Matsuda, for those encouraging remarks and for your continued partnership with T4P, which is greatly appreciated. Um, our partner today, of course, is MGIEP, the Mahatma Gandhi Institute for Education for Peace and Sustainable Development based in New Delhi. Uh, and MGIEP is uh, leading a lot of work on social and emotional learning. And we're very lucky to have with us today, Dr. Nandini Chatterjee, who leads the program EMC2, which is their program building this particular work on competencies in empathy, mindfulness, compassion, and critical inquiry using digital pedagogies. Nandini is a leading researcher globally in this area, so we're very lucky to have her today. And um, before I hand over to her, perhaps you could get out your mobile phones and have them ready, um, because you may be asked to use them during this session. So over to Nandini. Thank you so much, Sue, and thank you so much, uh, UNESCO Bangkok, for arranging this uh, wonderful uh, uh, webinar and uh, this discussion that is so crucial and important today. Uh, so let me start by sharing my screen and uh, is this visible to everybody? Perfect. Um, so we stand at a very important uh, and interesting stage in the future of humanity. We finally know enough about the human brain and how humans make decisions to be able to plan and train ourselves for a peaceful future. Okay? We no longer have to just respond to situations. And as a cognitive neuroscientist, this has been very, very exciting um, being part of this uh, understanding of how this happens. And what I'm hoping uh, to share with you today is how the neuroscience of learning and especially social emotional learning actually provides a way for us to build sustainable societies. So without further ado, let me take you to the mandate of the Institute and the mandate that all of us are discussing today. And that is to make an attempt and every attempt to achieve UNESCO's sustainable goal 4.7. And that's listed out here for you on the slide. But I want to highlight the key words that we want to achieve. 
Uh, requesting all participants to please mute themselves so that I can hear myself speak. Okay. So our keywords today are education for sustainable development, promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence, and global citizenship. And that's what we are going to talk about and see how. So let's start at the very beginning. And the big question we are trying to address is how can we bring about behavioral change? How can all of us? change our behaviors so that all the decisions that we make lead to actions which are peaceful and lead to global citizenship. So I want to take you, want to take you back to the point that every action that any of us take at any point in time is determined by a decision that we make. And that decision making happens in the human brain, okay? sitting between your two ears. So let's try and see what the brain tells us about this. So before we do that, um, I just want you to step back for a moment and see if you can recall how many decisions you think you make in a day. So here's a Zoom poll that is coming up for you. And I want you to take a guess on how many decisions do you think as adults we make in a day? So we'll pause for a minute. You have a question. Up there on your screen, make a choice and submit it. How many? Let's see what you think about decision making. It would be great if we could see some of the results of the polls. Is it possible to share the results? No, um, let me tell you the correct answer is 35,000. I bet many of you thought, and, and that's why this poll. Thank you so much. So, so, so a lot of most people think um, 10,000 decisions is what we make. But let me tell you that we make close to 35,000 decisions. And these are the results of a paper uh, that's been published in 2013 by La Buzetta, which was followed up by um, a study conducted by Cornell University, which actually showed that uh, we spend almost 13,000 decisions just on food alone. Okay? So you can imagine how much decision-making happens all the time. And it turns out that we are roughly making one decision every two seconds. Okay. So that's with regard to um, decision-making in adults. How many decisions do you think children make in a day? That's the second Zoom pool coming up for you. So I want you to realize the difference between children versus adults in terms of decision-making. So take a shot there. And we'll wait for the results of the poll to come up in a moment. Ten thousand decisions. Well, children make about three thousand decisions in a day. So you can imagine the scale of magnitude when you go from being a child to an adult. And if, in case you want to go ahead and confirm this, just go ahead and spend a day with a child and you will realize how much easier their lives are. Okay? And, and that's something maybe we want to learn from them. So now coming back to the question at hand as to how does decision-making actually happen? Okay? So I want you to focus on the right where you will see essentially in your environment, you have text or image or a voice Ooh. or anything that's happening in your thing that you're getting. That's something that the brain is processing and that's what we call as a top-down approach. Okay. But in addition to that, you're processing the sound, the, the quality of the image, 
all of that that's also happening, which is the bottom up process. Okay, so it's a combination of what your senses are experiencing and what you've experienced in the past. And that's where your memory comes in. The emotions that might arise because of the input you're receiving and the amount of attention that you're paying to it. So these three factors are all playing a role in how you will make a response or decision which will ultimately lead to action based on what's happening around you. That's how all of us behave. So now if you come to picture on the, on the left, what are two parts of the brain? What that in blue is, is the front of your cortex. That's the prefrontal cortex. This is the part that is the biggest in human beings because we make the most and the maximum decisions. Okay. That's the thinking brain. And a lot of our time in, in school has been focused on trying to build the capacities of the thinking brain. But you see in red to a very large region, which is sitting inside your brain. Okay? That's called the limbic brain or the emotional brain. Okay? And that's something that's actually evolved uh, over, the, over the past, over the past many years. Okay? So that's something that we share across evolution as opposed to the thinking brain, which is something that has expanded. And you can see also because of the connections that are there, that the emotional brain is physically, anatomically connected to the thinking brain. So every action that you take is determined by a decision, which in turn has a logical influence and an emotional influence. Yet we have spent very little time trying to train this emotional influence. How do we make sure that um, we use it the right way? A second point I want you to remember is the fact that the emotional brain works much faster than your rational brain, okay? So all decision-making composed of two processes, the fast thinking system, which is emotions, feelings, and very often stereotypes. And this is something I want you to remember, okay? Because this is something we want to try and address. How do we change that stereotypical response? And the second, which is a deliberate analytical rational response. And now because of the advances in neuroscience and of a wonderful process called neuroplasticity, which I will share with you in a minute, we now know that not only the rational brain, but even the emotional brain can be trained, okay? And so our purpose is how do we train the emotional brain to work with the rational brain so that our decisions are for peace and global citizenship? And education seems to be clearly the best place to start with it. And which is why the discussion that's so relevant for us today. So here's coming back to looking at what's neuroplasticity. So in, uh, in 2004, uh, a very important paper was published on how language is processed in the brain and how bilinguals uh, learn to make and use the brain to speak and use two languages. And during that process, uh, Draginsky showed in a very, very landmark paper that when the brain learns new things, it forms new connections. That was one important thing. So the brain changes structurally and functionally during learning. And so for all the teachers sitting out there in the audience, please recognize that you are forming these new connections in the brains of the children in your classroom. For all the parents sitting out there, for all the educators sitting out there, and in fact, for all of us sitting out there, we realize that the experiences that we are subjected to change our brain all the time. And so the most important point, if, if any, I want you to take away from the seminar is that the brain is malleable. It can change. And it is up to us to decide how we want to change it. And what we are advocating for is to change it for it to be able to take decisions for peace and kindness and global citizenship. So the brain is working like a muscle, just like when you go to the gym, 
and work on a particular muscle and it changes. Similarly, the brain forms new connections as you subject it to certain kinds of learning. And so it's important that the right kinds of learning begin to happen in the classroom. Now let me talk to you a little bit about this emotional brain, which seems to form such an important part of our focus. And why is that the case? So on the left-hand side, what you're seeing are regions of the brain that are involved in social and emotional learning. Okay. Uh, what you will see is uh, one region of the brain called the amygdala. Okay. So the amygdala is this little structure sitting here on the left in blue. And on the right, you can see that too. The amygdala is responsible for processing emotions. Okay. There's another little structure sitting out here called AI. It's the anterior insula. That's important for processing the emotions of others. And then you have structure sitting up here. IFG is the inferior frontal gyrus. IPS, the intra intraparietal sulcus. TPJ is the temporoparietal junction, and STS is the superior temporal sul sulcus. So why am I telling you these names? All these structures are part of a circuit which is responsible for processing theory of mind, which is the way we mentalize others. So a very important uh, notion that human beings have, which makes us different from others is, we understand that other human beings are like us, okay? And so we are able to understand their mental states. Okay? Now you are able to recognize those mental states in multiple ways. To give you a very simple example, when you see somebody eating um, a bar of chocolate or an ice cream, there are two emotions that you experience. One is you know that the person feels is feeling good, okay? That's the cognitive perspective taking. That's the theory of mind kicking in. But if you are emotionally also connected and recognize what emotion the person is experiencing, then your mouth begins to water too, okay? So you're participating in the emotional experience too, okay? So this requires us to build emotional literacy, therefore, and the ability to recognize when we can empathize with somebody. Remember, empathy is very different from sympathy. Empathy is the ability to understand what the person is going through, not necessarily to completely agree with, but to understand, okay? And if we can empathize with an individual, or as they say, get into a person's shoes. Remember when you get into wear somebody else's shoes, you recognize what's comfortable, what's uncomfortable, how exactly that works. Only then do we have the ability to take an action to make change. And therefore, given the fact that we have this circuit in the brain, I mean, it's, it's a biological circuit, we now have to find the means and the training so that this circuit can work towards empathy. In order to be able to do that, that circuit has to engage with that person in the moment. And that's why we need mindfulness and we need mindful engagement. And then finally, we need to build an action to be able to build, change the state wherever we feel that there is unfair or injustice happening. And those are what form the cornerstones of social and emotional learning. So if I had to define social and emotional learning, there are three important factors. One is to build emotional literacy to be able to empower our children to identify their own emotions, then they, they can therefore understand the emotions of others better, be socially connected with that individual and be present in the mind, in the classroom, not distracted somewhere else. And then based on these two factors, to take decisions with compassion so that we may lead towards peaceful societies. And therefore, uh, the image on the right really is that just as we train our children to do literacy, numeracy, learn, learn the alphabet, learn numbers, we can now teach them how to learn to be kind to. Okay? We now know that children are born kind. 
you know it's it's it makes our work in many ways much easier because human beings are born to be naturally kind okay we just need to nurture it so that this is something that becomes part of their classroom and part of the activities that they do in their classroom okay. and one of the best ways to try and do it is for us to be kind ourselves because children learn a lot from imitation and so we need to practice what we preach so to lay them out what are the key competences we want to build in our children emotional literacy empathy and a third important factor which has become very very important especially in these covid times and that's resilience is when you encounter change or a failure how do you find the strength to be able to cope and to come back and one factor that is found to be very very useful here is to be able to recall positive events that have happened in the past so it's important for us to build positive memories and to realize that whenever you are experiencing an emotion that is uncomfortable or challenging how by engaging in a mindful activity so by doing something with your hands you can actually distract the brain into not feeling negative but draw it towards a positive activity okay that's a very important finding that we have had about how mindfulness is so important in the classroom so that children focus on the task at hand okay. and finally how these could be highlighted and used so that it works towards behavioral change and what's the behavioral change we want to bring about the ability to discard automatic responses remember that stereotypy that we talked about at the beginning how we don't resort to stereotypy to take a response but take a response which is relevant to the situation at hand and to always try and be keep compassion and pro social behavior that is behavior towards which is an act of kindness for the individual at hand okay so how does this link to global citizenship okay there's a question that people often ask us you know at ngip and so what i've tried to do in this slide is that global citizenship education is trying to empower learners to assume active roles okay so you want to take these the perspectives remember we talked about emotional and cognitive perspective taking both locally and globally and that's where the social learning becomes important and in order to build peaceful societies we need to take compassionate action be tolerant if we learn to be empathetic and flexible we can learn to be tolerant we can encourage and be learn to live with diverging views and finally build resilience which in turn will lead towards inclusive and secure societies so these are the sel perspect uh, competencies which we if we build in our children we can actually try and teach them the skills of global citizenship and peaceful and sustainable societies a second very important issue that uh, social emotional learning helps us address is try and help our children have better mental health okay and therefore these are the different uh, factors which social and emotional learning also benefits S uh, increased empathy risk reduce risk towards mental illness and depression um i'm already out of time but i want to tell you that there are there's a lot of literature available now on how to implement good and effective sel programs this is mgip's uh, emc square sel framework there's a lot of detail of this on our website and it is all available on framerspace.com which is really a a new website and learning platform that mgip has created in order to be able to build a uh, social emotional skills in teachers in students and how to integrate them in the classroom and finally just before uh, we end um, i want to leave the teachers with um, four things that you can practice in your classroom and i promise i'll keep it under a minute okay So if you focus on your most difficult child by spending 2 minutes in a day for 10 days in a row just talk to the child not about academics just talk to the child there is evidence to show that the child's behavior will change okay 
just because it's getting that attention. Spend time in your uh, class where children and you listen to each other. Let's spend less time talking and more time listening. Let's teach our children to count their breaths to be able to recognize their emotions. And let's most importantly begin to practice gratitude for what we already have. We have a number of things for which we can be grateful for. And the last activity really was for all of you uh, to share one facet of your life that you are grateful for today. If we may have the permission of the organizers to spend one minute on just doing this and I will stop at that. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask. Um, so uh, the, the link is there in the chat. You can also put your phone on this QR code and it will open up a site. And if you can put in one word on what you are grateful for right now, we would have already begun the process of social and emotional learning. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask Mayank to scare, uh, share his screen for a minute if possible to um, see what are the different facets that um, people are talking about. Thank you so much, everybody. Continue to be grateful and spread kindness in the world. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Nandini. That was fascinating. I'm sure everybody agrees with me. Um, I learned a lot and I really like the way that you presented it so that we could all understand that. So thank you so much. Um, and hopefully that's a really good setting now to hear about some practical experiences of applying this in education, which is what our panel is about. So I'm going to hand over now to Kayunga Bang, who is a project officer here at UNESCO, and she will moderate the panel. Over to you, Christy. And please mute your mic if you're not a speaker. Thank you, Sue, for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this webinar on this important topic of social emotional learning to build peaceful and inclusive and resilient societies. Uh, we have three esteemed speakers with us today uh, who bring with them wealth of experience uh, and expertise and who will be sharing their insights on the topic over the course of session today. Uh, they will dive deep into SEL policies and practices in the region, uh, namely from Maldives, uh, Japan, and India. With this session, we hope to trigger the conversation around cross-country and multi-level advocacy in support of social emotional learning, policies and programs for inclusive and quality education. Uh, we have with us first uh, Mr. Hussein Majid, Education Development Officer Coordinator uh, Ministry of Education from Maldives. Uh, Mr. Hussein's role is to provide in-service and professional development support to academic staff in schools and to manage teacher resource centers established in atolls for decentralization of in-service and professional development programs. He also serves as a co-chair of the Digital Learning Working Group of the Global Collective for SEL and Digital Learning launched by UNESCO MGIP in 2020. Next, we have Ms. Sayaka Matsukura, uh, English teacher at the Public Junior High School in Japan. Um, as the head of research, Ms. Matsukura is in charge of developing teaching materials, conducting evaluation research and planning, and organizing teacher training for global citizenship studies and has been involved in a curriculum development for global citizenship studies since 2015. She is also involved in the promotion of development education. Uh, and then we will be hearing from Ms. Reshma Piramal, uh, co-head of operations, Sea Learning India and Max India Foundation. Ms. Piramal co-heads uh, operations at Sea Learning India Emory University's 
a K-12 education program providing educators with skills to foster emotional, social, and ethical intelligence development for students and themselves. Her commitment to disseminating uh, C-Learning's work addresses the need to embody skills we wish to teach and recognizing the cultivating compassion in the way forward. She is a co-chair of the M uh, UNESCO MGIP's Global Working Committee for SEL. Each speaker will have eight minutes for the presentation and we will open up the floor for the Q&A session. Uh, please don't forget to use chat box function down below to send your questions. And when you send your question, please uh, uh, type uh, the, your question is directly to which speakers. So warm welcome to our uh, speakers. With that, I would like to now invite Mr. Hussein, our first speaker to start this off with his presentation. Over to you, Mr. Hussein. Uh, thank you, Christy. Uh, good morning, and my big afternoon and good evening to some of you. Um, I'm Hussein Majid, as she has introduced me, working at the uh, National Institute of Education and the Minister of Education of the Maldives. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a brief of uh, what is happening in the Maldives uh, related to social and emotional learning. Um, with this presentation, I'll uh, introduce um, what is happening in the Maldives. Together for Peace webinar is the one we are going on with. And in this one, uh, SCL, Social Emotional Learning in the Maldives. I'm going to highlight on what is going on in the Maldives right now. Uh, next slide, please. Slide. Um, social Emotional Learning in the Maldives. Um, global citizenship and uh, digital citizenship or digital learning, whatever we call it, are uh, taken together is what is going in the Maldives. We are um, piloting these two programs in the Maldives and together we take this. Plus, uh, of course, we give other, um, a lot of other uh, areas we include in that one to call it the uh, SCL in the Maldives. Uh, but basically right now, these two are going on with additional um, lectures and additional information and awareness programs are provided on social aspects, social emotional aspects. Okay. Um, the, uh, we started with teacher training uh, with, with the help of uh, MGIP um, India, UNESCO MGIP. They uh, actually initiated the program with us, collaborated with us, and uh, we are very happy that we um, got involved in their um, uh, in collaboration with them, we are carrying out this program. We have 10 teachers trained in 2009 at UNESCO NGIEP, that is face-to-face -face programs and refresher training for two teachers and one official happened last year. That also was face-to-face, -face, not last year, okay, the year before that, 2019. And last year it was online, of course, uh, we were not able to travel uh, for most of the uh, uh, year and it was very restricted. Uh, it was online uh, refreshing course and our pilot programs started in 10 schools last year, that is 2009, uh, 2020. Okay. So, uh, and um, this program uh, went on for some time and then we uh, compiled their um, thoughts, what is happening in schools, uh, informed other schools, and then we had a kind of SEL inauguration uh, for the modules, which is the uh, event where we are uh, bringing in SEL into the Maldives. Um, next slide, please. So in um, what we are doing right now, as I said, is the uh, two pilot programs not completed yet. Once this is completed, we, we have, uh, let me just give you a brief of this uh, global citizenship. This is one program, right? Um, this has, um, Migration, governance, citizenship, identity, and violence, uh, we, we call SEL empathy, okay, mindfulness, compassion, and critical inquiry. Uh, uh, Nandini has already highlighted all this. And we have participants, um, number of participants, 286. Uh, students enrolled 286, participate in schools five, 
and the age group is 12 to 15 years. Um, that's our primary great children here is involved in that. Uh, and implementation is ongoing. Last year, we faced a lot of uh, difficulties and school, schools were closed for some time, totally closed for some time. And then uh, with um, COVID guidelines from the government, we started the schooling and that was very much limited time plus limited number of children at a time. Um, so everything was very much limited. Plus the remaining part we carried online. So um, the, we were not able to complete the implementation last year. Next slide, please. Uh, this is, uh, then we have the DICE program, Digital Intercultural Exchange or Digital Learning, let's call it. And this program is also taken into another five schools, but one school is right now um, in one school, it's not going on. There are uh, problems there in that school kind of, uh, um, uh, they are very busy with something else from the government. So uh, right now it's not going on there. So it's actually five, uh, four schools in which it's going on now. The number of children is around 200 and age group is the same. Uh, implementation is ongoing. So what we are doing in the mall is for um, SCL is the, uh, these two pilot programs are going on. Once this is finished, based on the results, uh, what the uh, Ministry of Education has decided is that, of course, SCL program we have launched. So we will carry on this program into more schools uh, that will be piloting, kind of piloting phase two program. Um, and then uh, we will see the effect of it. Even now, I have um, talked to these teachers who are carrying on these programs. There are changes, of course, they are seeing in children. But as I said last year, most of the time they were away from the school. So um, uh, the expected behaviors, the uh, uh, observation, real observations weren't happening at the, uh, um, in, in the schools to the level that we expected. The next slide. Next slide. So um, this is the plan just I have highlighted. So we will be expanding it to other schools. As I said, in addition to this, of course, we have some of the uh, emotional, uh, social uh, helping sessions that are going on for teachers. Um, the government Ministry of Education has given, uh, of course, kind of uh, awareness or orientation program to almost all the teachers working in schools on these social aspects. Okay? That is the uh, related to, uh, of course, the COVID experience. So uh, we, when we were locked down, we were, um, there were a lot of emotional problems that are coming in. So the ministry has given at least an orientation to all the teachers. It is not possible to give a very uh, uh, advanced training to all at once, but it's going on. Okay? So we will be uh, carrying on this program in the modules. At the same time, we'll be, we'll be collaborating with uh, UNESCO and GIAP uh, India. And also we hope the same things will go on with what we are starting for uh, with the Bangkok. Um, we can collaborate and there are of course aspects we can do collaboration in this. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, okay. I think I'm on, on mute, uh, unmuted. Thank you, Mr. Hussein, for your uh, presentation. It was interesting to see uh, Maldives government's commitment to foster uh, SEL policy and how to translate the policy into action. Um, and we know uh, uh, that this change doesn't happen overnight. So uh, uh, it, it would be interesting to see how the SEL uh, implementation will take place in Maldives in the future. Uh, I think it leads nicely to our next speaker, uh, Ms. Sayaka, uh, for her presentation on the cases from Japan. Uh, over to you, Ms. Sayaka.
OK. So everyone, can you see my slide? Is that OK? Yes. Yes. Okay. OK, so thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and uh, good morning, good afternoon. This is Sayaka. Thank you for having this opportunity. I'm an English teacher working at a junior high school in Japan, and at the same time, I'm a graduate school student on education in Sofia University in Tokyo. So today, I will talk about my global citizenship education practice in my previous school, and then how the GSET practice foster SEL, both student and the teachers as well. So first I will mention the GSET implementation as a case study. So Ageo Higashi Junior High School, this is a today's case study school. It, 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 it was one of the experimental schools by Ministry of Education in Japan, 2015 to 2018. Uh, I have worked there as a head of research and an English teacher, then coordinating the GSET project for four years. This GSET project has some unique future descriptions, such as a four school approach, developing curriculum without any concrete models. Okay, and then here I showed some activities here. Okay, and those activities aim is learning for achieving SDGs. In seventh place, it means about 12 to 13 years old student. This had started with global issues such as uh, climate change, hunger problems, or refugees, and so on. The important things are not for teaching those global issues, but also learning with experience experiences. In eighth grade, students decided a certain topic with teacher and classmates to create the sustainable society. While they learn the topic, they have a chance to study with some organization out of school, such as NGOs or companies or universities and so on. And the students have uh, chances to visit a place to meet some experts. In ninth grade, they focus on the local issues, it means the city. So we are living in Ageo city in Saitama prefecture. Students try to make proposal to make our city again more sustainable. Though uh, through those activities, teachers expect those eight competencies. The competencies is put here for the student, and uh, these competencies are quite uh, very very. We we can find a similar point to SEL. Okay. And in the grade eight and the grade nine, the content differs from year to year, as it is up to the student to decide what they want to study or what they want to learn. The important things is to deal with authentic issues. For Japanese junior high school students, sometimes global issues can sound like a distant country. However, in the global citizenship education classes, we have we have been working on ways to make such issues as our own issues okay and then the way of learning is also unique later than teacher teaching the class takes a form of a workshop and global work a group work or sometimes we did field work as well for those reasons we have focused on the role of a teacher as a facilitator facilitator here it means to connect the study to study so school and society and to, to promote or coordinate student learning. Teachers have also taken the role of one who inquires with students. You can see some pictures. I put the four pictures on the slide and then two photos above the actual GSET classes in the classroom. This is how the class conducted with the student discussing and presenting something topic to each other in a small group. The bottom of photos are students visiting an expert, learn more about the topic. One uh, on the left side is uh, visiting a JICA facility in, in Tokyo. And on the right side, it is a, a time to visit to a university professor to ask about how education can contribute to peace building. Okay. I'd like to mention how it relates to SEL. In the GSET classes, we have incorporated SEL into the competencies, as I mentioned. 
with referring to the learning domains listed by UNESCO, uh, I put on the picture on the, uh, the right side. As a result, according to the student questionnaire survey from NIST 2015 to 2018, the SEL skill listed here, such as respecting diversity, shared responsibility, and social connected, have been developed. The question that showed statistical differences are shown in the slide. The percentage of the student who answered yes or somewhat yes to those questions increased after taking a GSET classes. We believe that the content and the methodology or pedagogy of the GSET classes have helped the student to develop SEL. And then I also mentioned about the teacher's training. And for the teachers at Agio Higashi Junior High School, uh, it was the first time to face of GSET project for most of the teachers. Therefore, we repeatedly conducted teacher training program, such as facilitation training and workshop experience as shown in the table. Uh, those teacher training programs were great help to the teachers in the meaning of two places. So one is a place to share and discuss their concerns and GSET classes. And the second is a place to get a new perspective on education. As a result of the cycle of this teacher training, these classes that teachers themselves have changed to take on the role of facilitators. Besides, their belief on education have transformed. I found that this model of teacher learning and the teacher change were similar to the process of teacher change described of the Gasky in the American in the United States. So I showed the model on the left side, so you can see the model on the slide. Okay. And then the result of the questionnaire survey will show how they said the practice have impacted teachers and how they related to the teacher SEL. When teachers reflected on their transformation through GSET classes, they described the transformation in the teaching style and their life size as well. In the GSET classes, uh, the teachers were always thinking about global issues as their own issues. And then it is thought that the pra uh, practitioners themselves were able to connect their own lives with global issues. So I showed the, some questionnaire survey on the right side. The questionnaire shows uh, that compared to teachers without the GSET experience, those with GSET experience tend to have the SEL skills such as respect for diversity, shared responsibility, and then socially connected. The questions shows on the slide, the, it is the items that show the statistically significant differences. So in the end, uh, throughout this project, it brought SEL skills for students and teachers as well. It, it would strongly connect to the building piece throughout the education. Okay, thank you very much. This is my presentation. Ah, okay. <laughs> now I can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sayaka. Um, it's no secret that addressing students' uh, social and emotional learning needs through a school wide approach um, is darkly correlated to students' achievement. Um, it was interesting to see how uh, SEL can help students center pedagogy in the classroom and how teachers are empowered to deliver uh, GFIT content students using the SEL pedagogy. Uh, thank you again. Uh, now we are moving on to Ms. Rashma uh, from India. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you very, very much. I'm going to just share my screen first. Um, thank you very much. Much gratitude to all the organizers as well as the participants who've taken the time out to come here and listen. While my colleagues before me, from the keynote speakers to Nandini, 
uh, have made a wonderful case for social and emotional learning. I come here not to make that case. I come here actually to talk about how this could look in your classroom, how this could look in a school setting. Um, I had the social, emotional and ethical learning curriculum in India, which is um, developed at Emory University as part of the Tibet Emory partnership. And I'm here to talk about my experiences in working with teachers and educators in India, taking this curriculum and the dissemination of this into schools. So I have a quote up here. Um, before you finish eating breakfast in the morning, you've uh, depended on most of the world. And this is a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. And I ask all of us to reflect on this because if we are to move towards a systems thinking approach to address the pressing problems of our time, we need to recognize that interdependence and interconnectedness is a key. And if we are to think of interconnectedness and interdependence, we first must recognize that before we go there, we need to think about an awareness of self. And we have an example just today in the morning, so many of us uh, didn't mute our microphones because we were not aware that the noise that we were making was perhaps impacting um, some of the speakers who were sharing. But that comes not because there was an intention to disrupt, but because there was a lack of awareness. And I think for us as individuals to recognize or to be aware is really, really key because what it says is that we are not an island, but we are part of a larger collective. And if we as teachers and educators wish to awaken our students, we first need to awaken ourselves. So we need awake teachers to kind of take the pedagogy or a curriculum of social emotional learning into the classrooms. And when I speak about awareness, it's beyond uh, mindfulness. It is about an insight into our mental experience. Nandini so beautifully articulated that. It's about heedfulness. It's about familiarization. And eventually it's about discernment. How do you make a choice, a choice that is wise, that is benefiting not just you, but a larger community, which you are part of. So I'm here to talk about two programs. I'm not here to talk about the social, emotional, ethical learning curriculum that I represent. Uh, the um, uh, framework and that body is available freely on the websites. Uh, I'm here actually to talk about its translation into classrooms and specifically how and why uh, teachers need the kind of support and development of practices that is required for any SEL program to be successful. And uh, the C-Learning program in India, we have invested in what we call fostering communities of practice that are over and above training uh, teachers in pedagogy, training teachers in the curriculum. And what we mean by communities of practice is one must recognize that if we are to make any kind of shift or any kind of change, what we need here is um, an understanding and attention training, uh, an ability to begin to cultivate certain uh, skills that would take us and our students towards a more embodied understanding of what SEL means. And that SEL could be defined as resilience, attention training, collaboration. So we work very, very closely with teachers to help provide opportunities and platforms to actually reinforce these practices because practices only get better through perfection. And that comes through repeated, sustained um, kind of uh, work because if one is to get proficient at any skill, you need to make sure that it is something that is uh, consistent and happening on a regular basis. And the reason I say that is because if we were to ask someone to play a guitar and say, you know, we mandate everyone should learn how to play a guitar. If as a teacher, you don't know how to play a guitar and you're just given a manual, how are you expected to take it into your classroom? So our eventual aim is about embodiment. It's about cultivating an enduring capability, uh, cultivating, let's say, for example, compassion or kindness or attention. If we practice it and if we are those co-travelers with the students, with our class, then um, 
the dissemination of that understanding is far, far more authentic than if it is something just as a checkbox. So I have to teach trigonometry and so I shared the skills of trigonometry, but I become that. Um, if I move quickly, how we kind of do this, uh, one of the things that we have been really, really focusing on is creating study circles. So while our teachers get trained in our curriculum and try them in classrooms, they also are part of a study circle uh, group, which is basically a community of practice, which is run on a bi-monthly basis. Again, these are consistent opportunities for practicing, for sharing, for building familiarization and proficiency. There's a peer-to-peer -peer engagement. So it isn't an expert sitting there and saying, this is what you should do, but this is things that you try and test and, and share with others. Um, all our practices are resiliency informed. So we come from a space of recognizing not that the teacher or the classroom, there's a problem, but that there's already a strength there. You've already survived a lot of things. So how do you build on those strengths? How do we empower both teachers and students to move ahead? Um, so this is, I'm, I'm, I'm providing you with in some way a sample of one of the programs that we run for building teacher capacity. The other one that I will very briefly talk about is a program that we actually had at the COVID time, which was uh, the C learning practices, as I mentioned, these foundational skills that are important for any teacher to take into the classroom. We offer them as way of uh, worksheets and sound files in the absence of schools and in the absence of teachers. So they went through the state government, um, went through WhatsApp, and this is a recognition that most kids do not have access to online, uh, forget a laptop. Many of them may not even have smartphones. So while an entire state chose to share this via WhatsApp, we recognize that about a million kids in government aided schools had access to um, WhatsApp. And from that about 20,000 children uh, from uh, grade three to grade 10 accessed our program. Um, we worked across um, districts in one state. We've partnered with UNESCO MGIP to conduct baseline and inline surveys. Hopefully Nandini will have results soon, which look promising. But the idea here is to adapt uh, uh, to a situation, the COVID situation, and to continue with providing uh, children uh, resiliency practices that they could kind of take in the absence of a classroom situation. The drawback here is that it does not allow for critical insight and embodied understanding, but nonetheless, it is something that we can give the kids in absence of um, you know, any kind of classroom engagement. It was very consistent. And I will end by just you know, showing you what these um, worksheets look like that went through WhatsApp. And we had a sound uh, uh, file that accompanied it. I'll just play five seconds. <laughs> So um, I'm going to just end here saying that this was uh, in the local language. So the very same um, uh, skills or challenges, as we call them, which were built on over a consistent period of uh, 16 weeks were also accompanied by audio. So this was low tech, no fancy game, but nonetheless, we got through to a lot of kids. And I'm going to end my presentation here just uh, and say a big thank you and um, hope that all of you as, as educators out there uh, have the opportunity to take into your classrooms and to work on yourselves as well and support yourselves because uh, we need self-compassion and self-love if we were to if we are to go and share that with our kids. So thank you very much and and um, much much gratitude to all the teachers out there. Done an amazing piece of work. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Rashma. Thanks. Uh, it's Thanks, very Rashma. It's very interesting to uh, hear the fostering community of practice and bringing community for the successful implementation of SEL. Uh, I think this is what uh, Nandini really illustrated, like building positive memory leads to building positive behavior activity leads to resilient society. So now uh, we will open up the floor for question and answer. Uh, we can see a lot of questions are coming in uh, and we have selected uh, for uh, speakers uh, from the panel session and also the, for the keynote as well. Um, so uh, Nandini, 
uh, uh, what tool or instrument would you suggest to measure or evaluate the development of learners on their SEL skills? How does SEL impact learning? Um, so thank you very much, very important questions. Um, so there are multiple tools available to assess SEL and uh, it's very important that you use the right tool for the right age group, okay? Because uh, different kids, uh, dif depending on the age that you're looking at, the tools would be different. Uh, what I'm also very quickly going to share with you is um, a tool that uh, we developed just recently, which is very quick and just consists of uh, 20, 10 questions online. And um, I'm going to request uh, Mayank to quickly share it. So here's a tool already available for you to use uh, SEL skills. Uh, very simple, straightforward. And uh, what would be wonderful is if you can find a way to also translate this in the language that the kids are most comfortable with. And uh, we'd be happy to work with you in terms of looking at the technicalities of uh, the tool. So uh, there's a tool available. And secondly, with regard to your question on um, academic uh, scores. Okay? So there is a plethora of work to show that SEL improves academic scores as much as 11 points, 11 percentage points. And um, I'm going to ask um, Mayank to share that link to that paper also in the chat box. So here's the evidence to, to find, to actually go and check on that. But if you just think about it from a very simplistic approach, kids who are more at peace and who have uh, better attention just do better in the classroom. So it's pretty simple, and but there are very good results and research studies to back that up. Thank you, Nandini. Uh, Mr. Hussein, uh, what are some of the details of the teacher trainings? Can you provide some concrete examples of what the teachers learn in terms of skills, competencies, or how to better teach learners? Over to you. Uh, thank you. The, uh, in terms of competencies of the teacher training, um, uh, once again, uh, we, the, our teachers for this, especially for the SEL, uh, uh, for the SEL component, we are taking the teachers that are uh, trained by the MGIEP. Uh, there we got, as I said, the two aspects. One is the uh, global citizenship aspect in which, of course, most of these things that, that we are talking about in SEL is included there. How to uh, bring peace, to love peace, uh, the most important thing is to um, bring the behavioral change that we are um, uh, expecting, right? And to bring this, of course, change, um, we need to do a lot of things. Uh, one thing uh, I could say is that um, the world in the past years, I don't know whether uh, others thinking are the same or not, has focused very much on mm -hmm. curriculum, especially the cognitive aspect of the curriculum. Where we are delivering content to students, are learning content, we are asking them to content, but if we just think of it, we know that by when you click your finger, you get all those information. So why are we forcing them to learn these things, take exams, by heart these things, but we are not spending our time on making them good, responsible, behavioral, and uh, what would I say? Um, people who are actually loving their nation and loving peace and loving nature. We don't have time to practice those things because of course that takes more time than showing them a slide and asking to um, learn all the things there on the slide, right? It takes more time for them to show behaviors and uh, bring those changing behaviors. So um, that is one aspect. And the other aspect is, of course, with related to COVID, it is more where we are going into the digital world, the digital stewardship or learning, that aspect. So through technology, how would we bring in, how would we incorporate these social aspects in that one? 
um, most of the time, and what we found is that we are using technology a lot, of course, not all useless because um, a lot of uh, speaker talking, discussions, everything is going on, but we know entertainment a lot using technology, but we are not, most of us are not yet so familiar to use the technology to bring in the social changes that are relevant to the society, that are beneficial for us, that are beneficial to the world. So we are teaching them to learn um, these aspects using even technology. So these are the things that our teachers have been uh, given um, on. So they are actually trying to implement them in schools at the pilot program. Thank you, Mr. Hussein. I think it's very relevant for the current uh, COVID pandemic situation. Uh, Ms. Sayaka, in your school, is GSET a separate subject or integrated across multiple subjects? How oh. do teachers introduce those SEL skills with the current curriculum uh, or subjects? How to teach integrate social emotional learning during um, distance learning? Mm -hmm. oh. That's for other speakers, but yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So actually, so global citizenship education is uh, one of the subject, not multiple or not integrated. This is one of the subject in the school curriculum. So, the, but uh, my previous school is one of the pilot school supported by Ministry of Education. But uh, so that is why we have a special, we, we, developed the special curriculum for the global citizens education yeah this is one of the one of the special cases for japanese junior high school especially in a public way yeah this is one of the, my answer so do, do you have any other questions christy uh, so it's more of uh oh, using how to the teach this year or something yeah yeah okay how to teach introduce uh, yeah yeah, introduce yeah. The SEO skills. yeah yeah Okay, so actually the teacher di teacher didn't to teach directly what is SEL or SEL is something, da, 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 da. but to, so throughout the learning global citizenship education or throughout the learning or global issues, we put into the SEL skill and the eight competencies from the GSET project. So actually we didn't teach what is SEL or something like we just we just to experience it, both global issues and then SEL together. I see. So it, it was more of SEL pedagogical uh, yeah, yeah. way to introduce. OK, mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Ms. Reshma, uh, with the current pandemic context, when some areas in the world have not re reopened schools yet and are into distance and remote learning, how do we foster and encourage SEL? Uh, what approaches can we explore? How to teach, integrate social emotional learning during distance learning, any strategies to integrate SEL virtually? Over to you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to speak just from uh, uh, our experience here. Uh, the C learning program is a program that we integrate across classrooms. So it can be taken into any classroom from math to science to anything. Um, and um, as some of my previous speakers said, the idea is that these are practices that, that you imbibe and these are practices that you take into the classroom. Uh, they're not necessarily a separate class, like a moral science class. So uh, in the COVID situation, because we recognize that a lot of countries don't have, um, a lot of populations don't have access to schools and maybe not even online education, uh, asynchronous classes, so to speak, we wanted to make sure, and we had that opportunity through the government, state governments of India, offering um, SEL curated programs to their uh, population. And so uh, we kind of recognize that what is really important are the practices. And uh, the C learning program actually very specifically focuses on these practices from attention training to resiliency approaches to body awareness and literacy, um, and then going further into, into understanding interdependence and compassion. So all these practices are repeated practices. And so we share these practices with kids, um, uh, as I said, through WhatsApp, through audio um, and um, 
as way of weekly challenges to make them more learning. But we do recognize and we do reinforce that in-person training is definitely more ideal. So while we do definitely, uh, you know, say that digital learning can definitely introduce them, but the idea is that to embody them eventually and to be reflective, one definitely needs the engagement with the teacher in the classroom. But this is, you know, in, in the event of not having anything, this is better than, than nothing because we recognize so many of the kids needed it. And uh, we had a lot of amazing feedback from teachers and kids uh, across schools who uh, said they benefited from these uh, practices that we had created uh, to be disseminated via the phone and WhatsApp. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Ms. Reshma. Yeah, I agree that, you know, SEL skill is, it's, it's been um, highlighted as an important skills during this pandemic. Um, so during this plenary session, uh, we have discussed evidence-based studies and emerging uh, practices at different level to promote social emotional learning for all learners. Um, thank you once again to all speakers for sharing your experiences that left the participants inspired and enlightened. Uh, we will continue our further discussion during our uh, breakout session, which will take place right after the session. So over to you, Sue, for uh, your uh, explanation for how the breakout session will be arranged. Thank you. Thank you, Christy and the panelists. And now is your opportunity to speak more. And this is really important to us because uh, we are using this particular webinar as part of the design stage of our initiative Together for Peace. So the discussions and the comments and questions you have been putting in the chat, which are greatly appreciated, will all be going into the recommendations coming from this webinar, which will be in turn revisited as part of the regional dialogue and the regional development of the Together for Peace project. So I encourage you to participate and stay with us and um, keep the chats and the questions coming as well as speaking in the groups. You will soon see a button on the screen which allows you to um, register for a breakout room. One, policy implications. Two, teacher training. Three, pedagogy and assessment. And four, advocacy awareness and community support. Because of the large number of people who enrolled, the auto um, movement of people to the rooms will not work. So we ask that you manually select and enter the room and then you will automatically be um, moved back after the 30 minutes time. So please select your room now and uh, anyone watching on Facebook Live, you will be in room two, uh, teacher training, and you'll be able to watch that particular session. So over to the four moderators to take those away. from the breakout group discussions, uh, much appreciated. Apologies for all the technical hiccups uh, as we're going through this. Um, please, we're going to share with you now, uh, while, uh, while we collect some of the information from the breakout groups, we're going to share with you a Together for Peace video. So please stay tuned, we'll, we'll restart the plenary session in a few moments. From our tiny blue-green planet, we are able to see farther into our galaxy than ever before. In January 2020, NASA announced the discovery of another Earth-sized planet that might be able to host life at 100 light-years away. We are just beginning to explore the unknown. Yet what we do know is that our own home is under threat and we have a responsibility to protect. Earth 
has never been so vulnerable to harm caused by humanity. From pandemics and climate change to ongoing conflicts and nuclear proliferation. The priority must be to prevent these disasters, which we know affect vulnerable communities first and most severely. The Together for Peace initiative recognizes that sustainable development and a culture of peace are inseparable. Education is one path linking human rights and gender equality, global citizenship and cultural diversity. These are the foundations of positive peace, not just absence of conflict, but also the presence of justice. UNESCO's work towards positive peace in the Asia-Pacific spans every sector, from education for sustainable development and shared histories promoting dialogue through common heritage and values to promoting the science to address climate change and efforts to curb rising levels of pollution. Together for Peace creates a platform including countries, civil society and members of the public to strengthen our ability to build a durable, positive peace in the region. the uh, video the My name is Ja from Bangkok, Thailand. With the creation of the Benjamin Spanning the Generations program, I aim to help nurture and develop young people's knowledge and curiosity about the traditional art form Benjamin, a special type of enamel porcelain. The main way I work for peace is by advocating intergenerational exchange and supporting youths to positively influence their communities. For me, peace entails societal harmony free from hostility, conflict, and violence. Okay, so welcome back and thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed those videos. Um, we also showed some of the youth videos from the waiting room. Um, we, we have uh, got the feedback from the four sessions and I'd like to invite um, Professor Kazuhiro Hoshida, who is from the 
Hiroshima University and plays a leading role in um, SDG 4 globally and how this SDG focused on education is unfolding. Um, he's going to summarise those notes for you, uh, the key takeaways from those four sessions. So over to you, Professor Yoshida. I don't see Professor Yoshida. Is he there somewhere? Okay, now uh, I think yes. my, my muting uh, function has been locked. So <laughs> sorry okay, for sorry. the uh, problem. Um, thank you very much, everyone. I was uh, joining the discussion in the uh, breakout room uh, three, but uh, thanks to the excellent uh, secretarial support, I have uh, received the summary of the uh, points that were discussed. Um, Okay, do you see the screen? Hello? Say yes. Okay, uh, yeah, just to recap quickly, uh, from the very beginning, what we knew was the fact that education uh, is regarded as a key enabler for the entire SDGs and the peace as well as education for sustainable development, GCED, socio-emotional learning, those are at the heart of target 4.7, which are in fact at the core of the SDG 4. So what we have discussed today uh, directly lead to the very important and uh, core messages that what education is expected to play in the uh, current context of SDG 4 uh, decade of action. And uh, what we have found today is that the pathways for transformation and the behavioral changes are in fact available. And so we have to now work on them or act on them. Uh, like the neurosciences, what we have uh, uncovered, uh, the classroom practices and the venue can be not only in school or research level, but in our daily life and in society. And now we are in a, a critical moment of the uh, COVID-19 new normal. So we have to use this occasion as an important occasion to uh, trigger innovation and transformation. And here are the uh, key messages that we have uh, uh, collected from. Uh, thank you very much for everybody who have actively participated in the thematic discussions. The theme one uh, talked on the policy implications and strategies to foster SEL. Uh, the context is very important and often SEL is uh, pre-contextualized. What sort of attitudes or values we want to inculcate uh, depends very much on the culture. Um, so I think this is also related to how the policy issues will be converted into practice that, that we will see later. The whole school approach is necessary. The whole school approach means that everybody uh, participates, uh, not only just one or dedicated teacher or subject, but everybody uh, will work towards that. And uh, cannot teach piecemeal, everyone is involved. I think this is a very important message. And there is often a lack of criteria for assessing SEL, which can discourage schools from using in curriculum and so on. Yeah, this is also an important one. And uh, the other group also have discussed uh, the, this point. So we will come back to them later. Um, second is the uh, teacher, teacher training and support for SEL. We need more practice at the level of classroom. I think this message means we need to uh, pull uh, good practices information or failure information so that we can learn uh, more from each other. Modules can be uh, 
uh, can have many options. Uh, role modeling, uh, gender sensitive. Yeah, I think there are various aspects of uh, actually working on the social emotional learning. Uh, we have to have a clear idea what scope and array of activities need to be incorporated in those modules. Teachers in the systems already also need support to putting the learners at the center of learning. Teachers at, at every moment is under enormous pressure, especially under this COVID uh, new normal uh, situation. And then where teachers have not practiced the social emotional learning, uh, it will add on further uh, workload. So there has to be a important supporting environment. The third a theme about the pedagogy and assessment. Uh, so this is directly uh, a lead from the uh, previous discussions. Creating or utilizing enabling conditions at the school level is very important so that teachers are free to implement classroom strategies across multiple subjects or within existing subjects and incorporate collaborative uh, actions, group work, project-based activities into classroom teaching and learning. And this may pose a further question in the uh, midst of uh, uh, online learning or remote uh, style of learning, how we actually e implement them. Uh, that kind of questions were also uh, seriously discussed. Emphasis on formative assessment and constructive feedback for fostering SEL based on these uh, a difficult but some successful uh, practices need to be utilized for uh, learning lessons. And lastly, for a uh, theme for advocacy, awareness, and community support. support. Sorry. Uh, we need to find a way to include SEL in everyday conversation, not just uh, uh, teaching and learning sessions and stop corporal punishment, very true, to uh, build a, a reliable and uh, uh, trustful relationship between those who teach and learn uh, uh, essential. Find ways to use social media influences. Yeah, I, I, uh, in this difficult moment, schools, some of the schools are even closed. Uh, using the available uh, means in an innovative way also will provide us new opportunities. Governments to provide support in outreach and awareness around socio-emotional learning and provide support to educators, parents, and teachers with online and offline materials on socio-emotional learning. Yes, um, the, the point that we have discussed around the world of SEL can be more broadly or locally adjusted. So, uh, I think today's discussion has given us a very important uh, opportunity to start uh, working on those matters. Thank you very much. I think I have covered the point. Over to you, Sue. So thank you very much, Professor Yoshida, and thanks to everybody for participating in the uh, breakout rooms. I think there's some really good content to carry forward there into the discussions on creating T4P, the initiative, um, a lot of questions to be answered still, but also I think some great suggestions about some of the things that we need to do. And some of them are clearly there's a lot of demand for. Um, and hopefully you've seen some resources and other things today that can also help you to follow through. So before I hand over to Dr. Ananta to close, I'd just like to reiterate thanks to all of the speakers um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Japan and all of you for participating. So um, Dr. Ananta is the director of the MGIAP, our partner for this particular event, and he is going to provide our closing remarks today. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, I hope everybody can see me and hear me well. Um, I've been sort of sitting in a listening in the background for about about an hour or so, and I'm really enlightened to see how social emotional learning has uh, is becoming something that is uh, really looked upon as a, as a necessity. 
as a necessary condition in, in education. Even on a, on a personal uh, voyage, uh, one has gone through some of the competencies that social emotional learning uh, puts in our students is, is going to be extremely useful. Um, I always sort of say, how can we find peace in the world when we are fighting demons within ourselves on a daily basis? When I, when I say that, that's kind of supported by the WHO re, uh, report, which says mental health is going to be one of the number one diseases in this world uh, as we as we move. And and with the corona, with the COVID uh, pandemic, that's uh, it's gone on an exponential uh, curve. So it comes in in a timely manner. I want to finish off today. Uh, I want to sort of say five take-home messages that I, I hope uh, kind of resonates with the participants today. And the first one starts off with, uh, and it, you know, it might be like a cliche, but I think it's so relevant. The preamble to, uh, seems to be some disturbances. Uh, but uh, the preamble to the constitution of UNESCO, uh, and I think that we should always keep that in our in the back of our minds, which when we say, since wars begin in the minds of men, I, I think we should now sort of say uh, uh, people, it is in the minds of people that the defenses of peace must be constructed. So uh, it, it's a change in mindset that we, re we need, uh, a behavioral change. And that's where the real main challenge is. It's the behavioral dimensions. And education has to really start moving towards actually influencing our decisions and the way we behave. Now, we have been told uh, you know, throughout uh, the times that we have always been in school and in society that peace and nonviolence is always the way to adopt. Uh, yet we see individuals and societies always taking into that the fight or freeze uh, kind of a mode and that's where the neurobiological dimensions come in and the immediate reaction is always one to fight or to freeze and and those who freeze the those who take fight take advantage of and and that really needs to change our whole mindset so even sometimes when i talk uh, when the, when i read books on the just war it seems to be so oxymoronic how can you justify war it shouldn't be justified on any conditions and so decision making leading to behavioral change happens through, and I think this is where we've got it wrong, is it's an interplay between emotions and cognition. We figured that by cognition itself, we are going to achieve that. And that's why we have tons and tons of books about peace and why peace and why nonviolence. But yet again, the emotions are the ones that actually have such an impact. And I tell you, as an economist, where we will talk, where we study about individuals' behavior, we are basically working from a model of rationality. And now we start to say, and now we're starting to realize that rationality is only part of the, the game and it's emotions that really drive it. And in fact, if you think about yourselves in many of the times that you have made decisions, the emotion comes into play. And, and this is where the good news is. We can train the emotion just as we train the cognition. And, and I think we must admit that we have done well, you know, to sort of uh, put a gloom and doom picture where wars and conflicts, if one looks back two to 300 years, you know, the, the whole fear of being, uh, uh, you know, being invaded, uh, raped and killed was such, was such a daily occurrence. We have, we have advanced. But what I think is we have reached diminishing returns. We have reached a plateau. And, and that's so much that cognition has played a role. It's now time to train the emotions just as we train the cognition. And that's my third take home message. My fourth take home message, I'm just flipping my pages here, is that social emotional learning is key to this training of the emotions. It's the emotional intelligence, the resilient mind the resilient emotion, uh, emotions that we, we're not talking about suppressing emotions. It's about understanding them, embracing them, and then to make those decisions based on that understanding. So it's important that in this, uh, you know, I hear a lot of times culture and context, and we have to understand that. I agree with that, but yet 
we must understand that we are one humanity and, and that we need to get rid of those differences, that us and them has to be diminished. And so with social emotional, I think in a sense that we will divide that. We will, we will kind of sort of, sorry, not divide, but minimize that division between us and them, but see each other as a human being, um, not as uh, one based on nationality, race, religion, or culture, as an individual, as a living human being. And the same thing with the way that we react with nature. And that I think if we do well social emotional is when we have really succeeded. And my final message is about making sure that we do it well. The quality of social emotional learning has to be done well, just like maths and physics and stuff. Quality is important. It has to be based on science and evidence. I did not see the word science in the, in the discussions that I was privy to. I, I heard and I'm happy to hear of evidence, but science plays such a big role. And we see this now from the COVID on how when science was not used, we were running around in circles uh, based on opinions and hearsays and stuff. Science must support our work. And as the Director General of UNESCO had alluded, had, uh, emphasized, UNESCO is moving towards a science-based kind of an organization. So I make a plea that when you look at uh, SEL frameworks and what you want to do in with SEL, look at, look at some of the properties and characteristics that will cut across irrespective of culture, race, or gender. And I think one of the things that we did in the MGIP is we did over two years, bringing in about 20 to, 50, uh, 20 to 25 experts from around the world to, to produce a review of what is out there. What is SEL? What are the de defining characteristics of SEL? What are the properties of SEL? How do you assess SEL uh, in, in a way that is conducive to the growth of the, of the learner? So with those words, I am really happy to see the outcome, the, 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 the planning of this workshop by the Bangkok uh, colleagues. Thank you very much. Really love the video, uh, the blue planet, the blue dot, uh, uh, and we usually use uh, Carl Sagan's words, but those were good. And I thank you very much. Uh, and a, and a great workshop. Kudos to the team. Thank you so much, Dr. Ananta, for those summary remarks. And um, I, I, I particularly get the point about science and evidence. And I think uh, Nandini's presentation was quite good at setting the scene as to exactly why that is important. And now we understand a lot more because I don't think everybody got the questions right. So the evidence, the science uh, uh, agreed is very important. So again, um, Thank you finally to all of the staff at MGIEP and UNESCO who have been supporting us here, moderators, note takers, IT persons, and thank you again to everybody for watching and we hope to see you again at the second seminar which will be on the 16th of February and we'll be looking at the relationships between humans and nature and how this is important for building peace in education. So enjoy the rest of the day and your week. Bye-bye. <laughs>